I'm trying to get rid of that. Good afternoon. Friends of the Library of Congress, students, staff, everyone who is joining us live on the Library of Congress's YouTube channel. I'm Colonel Karen Lloyd. I'm the director of the Veterans History Project here at the Library of Congress. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come see New York Times bestselling author Liza Monday who's going to discuss her book, Code Girls, The Untold Story of American Women Code Breakers of World War II. As many of you know, we were planning to hold this event at the beginning of the month. Mother Nature intervened. So we are here a few weeks later, and more determined than ever, to shine a spotlight on women who have made major contributions to our society. We know that it's never too late to celebrate the accomplishments of women, and I'd like to thank the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, and her entire leadership team for their commitment to helping us with this endeavor. I would also like to thank Doug Bennett for returning to Washington to be with us today. Today's events will focus not just on women, but on women veterans who raised their right hand, took an oath to support and defend our country, put on a uniform, and achieved some amazing accomplishments while, during, while enduring many sacrifices. You're going to hear their stories today, and hopefully you will learn about others in your studies or through the many resources we have here at the Library of Congress. As you do, keep in mind that there are thousands more women veterans whose names and stories may never be heard unless you reach out to the veterans in your lives and your communities to listen. Really listen to their story and then donate it to the Library of Congress. The Veterans History Project would also like to thank our co-sponsor, the Library's Young Readers Center. Devoted to the reading interests of children and teens, the Young Readers Center offers young people and their families the opportunity to experience the wonders and resources of the nation's library through ongoing programs and special events. They were instrumental in helping us reach out to schools so that their students will benefit from today's talk and to develop a deeper appreciation for primary sources that are available to them here at the library, but especially the Veterans History Project. With more than 105,000 collections in our archives, the Veterans History Project collects, preserves, and most importantly, makes accessible the story of United States military veterans who served in World War I through the current conflicts. So that future generations may hear directly from those veterans and better understand their selfless service. Our collections include video and audio oral history interviews, along with original photographs, letters, military documents, diaries, journals, and two-dimensional art. We, are not, we not only highlight our existing collections, but we continue to solicit volunteers like you from across the nation to gather their stories of veterans in their lives so that their first-person reminisces, personal philosophies, and creativity are preserved for posterity. In doing so, we all better understand our history. Today's guest presenter can attest to the value of our collections because she used them when conducting research for her book. As a former longtime reporter at the Washington Post, Liza Mundy is no stranger to research. A senior fellow at New America, her exploration of issues related to women and work resulted in her emerging as one of the nation's foremost experts on the subject. She is a frequent commentator on prominent national television shows, radio, and online news out outlets. She has contributed to numerous publications, including The Atlantic, Time, The New Republic, Slate, Mother Jones, and Politico. Now there's a range. In addition to Code Girls, Liza is also the author of The Richer Sex, How the New Majority of Female Breadwinners is Transforming Sex, Love, and Family, and also Michelle, a biography. After her presentation, Liza has graciously agreed to stay with us for a little while to answer questions from the audience and to sign copies of her book, which are available, available for purchase outside this room. Now please join me in welcoming to the podium our very special guest, Liza Monday.
Thank you so much, Wendy, for that great introduction. Thank you, everybody who, um, who came for the rescheduled event. Uh, thank you, Lisa Taylor. Uh, you've been incredibly hospitable and, and organized in, in both helping with my research and organizing this event. Uh, it's such a thrill to speak at the Library of Congress, obviously one of the great research institutions in the world, uh, particularly because the Veterans History Collection here was so fundamental and crucial to my research. When I was getting started uh, researching Code Girls, and when I was, in fact, um, shopping the book proposal uh, to editors in New York. Uh, apparently, one of the editors said that he thought that it was a great story, uh, but that he felt that, that it might be thin beer, because, uh, because so much time had passed since World War II. If there were any women code breakers out there, they would be in their mid-90s, you know, maybe wouldn't remember much, maybe there wouldn't be much of a record since it was top secret work. So I literally got up every day during my research and thought, I'll show you thin beer. Uh, <laughs> And, 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 and fortunately, I had the help of allies like the Veterans History Collection here. I literally just emailed uh, through the website saying, I'm working on this book, do you have anything? I instantly got a reply from Megan Harris saying, Yes, we have wonderful records, we have oral histories, we have supplementary materials. She provided me with a list of the names of women that they had taken their oral histories from, incredibly well organized. I came here uh, for you know, several days and, and listened and read uh, to, the, to the women who had told their stories. Many of them are no longer with us, but uh, fortunately their stories have been collected and reside here and many of them are available digitally. Uh, and so in the end, I was able to collect almost more material than I could cope with in reporting this book, both from living women and from wonderful archival resources like this collection, and able to substantiate the recollections of women who are still alive with the paper record, with oral histories of other women and other supplementary information. So I'm so grateful to this institution for facilitating research, for making American history accessible to researchers, to citizens, to everybody, uh, and then for holding events like this where you know we can continue to get the message out, and for supporting authors which is very important. So it's really thrilling to be here. It's also very thrilling to be here during Women's History Month. Uh, originally, I was going to be speaking at the beginning of Women's History Month, and, and now we've managed to squeak in the rescheduled event uh, when it's still March. And that's really very meaningful, because I think that we're at really a watershed moment in terms of, of rece receptivity to women's history. Of course, every month should be Women's History Month. It should be everybody's history month. Uh, but this month does have a special meaning. I, and I do think we're at a great moment. I think books like Hidden Figures that have been so successful in opening up the contributions that women have made to American military history, to American science, have really persuaded publishers uh, that there's an audience for these books, that people are receptive to these stories. You may know that the New York Times has started a new series called Overlooked, in which they're going back through their archival record and they're realizing that, 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 that incredibly important women passed from the scene and did not get obituaries, including Charlotte Bronte, women of, you know, of that stature were not recognized uh, at, during their time. And so the New York Times has this great new series in which they're going back and they're providing the obituaries of women who should have gotten recognition in their time. And I feel as though the publishing industry is doing the same thing today, and so it's thrilling to be part of it. Uh, and so when talking about code girls, about these thousands of women who came to Washington to uh, join the U.S. military and, and support the war effort, I like to start with this, uh, with this slide because it really illustrates the plight of the educated woman in 1942. Uh, this, this photo shows the May Court at Goucher College in the spring of 1942. Uh, some of you may know Goucher College back then was an all-girls school. The women who went there were called Goucher Girls uh, and uh, located in downtown Baltimore, D.C. It's now a co-educational university in suburban Towson, but at the time it was a city school. Uh, many of the young women who attended there were city girls who grew up in Baltimore, who walked to classes, in some cases couldn't afford to board because, of course, they had grown up during the Depression, um, and who were very, very... Uh, devoted and, and, and motivated to get a, a great four-year liberal arts education. Uh, Goucher was a very well-respected university. Its dean, uh, Dorothy Stimson, was a noted expert on Copernicus. The English professor, Ola Winslow, was the first American woman to win a Pulitzer Prize for biography. So top-notch faculty, uh, very tough school. Uh, and these young women were even more unusual than they would have known, because at, at this time in American life, only 4% of American women 
attained a four-year college degree. And the reason that percentage was so small was in part because so many schools were still closed to women. So many campuses did not admit women. Uh, the Ivy League, for the most part, was closed to women. Many, many private universities, many state universities. In my home state of Virginia, the University of Virginia did not give full degrees to women really until the 1960s. Uh, and so uh, there, were, there were not a lot of institutions to choose from. And of course, these wonderful women's colleges had been founded in the late 19th century at a time when many people believed that higher education was bad for women, that it made women uh, sort of you know, uppity and obnoxious. And, uh, and there was actually a belief that education wasn't good for women. Too much learning wasn't good for women. There was a Harvard physician who argued that, um, that, that too much education made women infertile, uh, that, it, that it swelled their brains at the expense of their wombs. He literally ar argued that, and people believed it. So these women colleges like Goucher had been created at a time when they had something to prove. They felt that they had to prove that women deserved an education, that it was worth educating women, and that it was good for women to be educated. Uh, but of course, another reason that the numbers were so small is that Families realized that there was not an economic payoff to educating a daughter the way that there was for a son because the professional fields open to educated women were so limited. If you were a woman who was motivated to become a doctor or a lawyer or an architect or a businesswoman or an engineer or a scientist, you would be lucky to find a spot in a graduate school. Many, many graduate schools were closed to women. Many fields were virtually closed to women. And so the only job you could expect graduating from a fine college really reliably was teaching school. And that's great if you want to be a school teacher. But if there's another field that you're interested in, then it presents a very narrow field of endeavor for women. And even then, only until uh, you get married can you expect a school teaching job. Back then, there was something called a marriage bar. Uh, and so if a woman got married, she was required to quit teaching you know, and to stay home with her husband and her family. So there wasn't a great economic payoff to getting a college degree for women. And parents, again, coming out of the Depression, uh, you know, they made that calculation. Now, of course, the other reason for a woman to go to college for which there might be an economic payoff was to get the proverbial MRS degree, uh, which was a thing back then. Uh, the idea that if you went to college, then you can date men at neighboring men's schools. You could marry a man from a good family or with good prospects, you know, and you could get yourself situated in life. Maybe you would teach for a couple years to put him through law school or whatever, uh, but that there would be an economic payoff to marriage. And so these young women who were academically motivated, who were very challenged by their classes, were also very pressured, particularly in their senior year, to get engaged, you know, to get that ring, uh, to have their future assured. And so these schools had ceremonies like the May Court. Now, as far as I can tell, the May Court was some sort of remnant of a pagan fertility ritual in which the young women, you know, selected presumably because of their beauty or their personality or their family or their, or their academic standing would be elected to the May Court. You see the queen up there in the chair. Uh, and they would be sort of symbolically ushered into the marriage market. And all of the women's colleges had rituals like this. Wellesley College in Massachusetts had the senior class hoop roll. And the, and the legend of the hoop roll was that the winner would be the class's first bride. Uh, so that was the great distinction. And um, uh, so, uh, and, and I interviewed many of these women, and they remember the intense pressure to get married at the time. And Wellesley actually had a section of the yearbook that listed women and their engagements and who they were engaged to, as well as women who had gotten married even before graduating and had left college in many cases uh, in order to get married. So again, that gives you a sense of how hard these women had worked to get their schooling, uh, but the, the sort of the very limited field of, of life prospects that they were looking at upon graduation. But what I love about this particular photo is that unbeknownst to anybody, including their colleagues on the platform, two of these women, this is Jacqueline Jenkins, that was her name at the time. Uh, later on when she married, she would be Jacqueline Jenkins Nye, the mother of Bill Nye the science guy. Uh, so you can get a sense of her intellectual chops, uh, as well as uh, her friend Gwyneth Gaminder. These two young women had already been secretly selected and tapped by the US Navy, and they were receiving training in cryptanalysis, which was a field that they would never have heard of, that nobody had ever heard of. They were receiving weekly instruction in a locked classroom at the top of Goucher Hall, taught by Ola 
Ella Winslow, uh, the English teacher who doubtless was only maybe a chapter ahead in the correspondence course that the U.S. Navy had, uh, had compiled to teach them this arcane field that had been around since the time of Julius Caesar or probably since the time that human beings learned to write or communicate at all because, you know, it is sort of human instinct to send secret communications to somebody who you have an urgent message for uh, and not have anybody else be able to listen in. And so this field had been around really for centuries, uh, but not so much in the United States, and nobody really uh, in the mainstream had heard of it. Uh, and so they were being taught all of a sudden uh, in great secrecy. They couldn't tell their brothers, their boyfriends, their family members. Their, they couldn't tell their roommates what they were doing. They were learning how to take frequency counts. They were learning the behavior of letters in the English language and the French language. They were learning how, um, how alphabets could be scrambled, tables could be constructed it in order to disguise secret communications. And the reason that that was happening, of course, was because in December of 1941, on December 7th, uh, the Pacific Fleet had been attacked at Pearl Harbor. It was a great shock and surprise to the nation, to the world. It was a surprise attack. We hadn't seen it coming. We lost thousands of, of, of young American uh, servicemen. And, uh, and so, we were launched formally into World War II. Uh, World War II, of course, had been raging in Europe for several years. We knew that we were go gonna join the fighting at some point, but we didn't know that it was gonna happen abruptly uh, after December 7th. The next day, of course, Congress declares war on Japan. Three days later, Germany declares war on us, and all of a sudden, the U.S. is launched into what was called total war. All the young men signed up to fight. Japan thought that the attack at Pearl Harbor would bring us to our knees, that it would demoralize us, that we would allow them to keep the holdings in the Pacific that they were conquering even as they were bombing Pearl Harbor. And it had, it had the opposite effect on the American public. Uh, you know, we rose up at arms. Every family was determined to contribute to the war effort. Every young man wanted to be in military uniform. And all of a sudden, all the young men were shipping out to the Pacific, to islands, you know, that most Americans had never heard of, to the European theater. Men were suddenly on convoys going to Europe. Uh, it was just a, an evacuation of the men. Uh, at the, at, so at the same time that suddenly we're going to be fighting these battles, you know, strung out thousands of miles around the world, uh, we know that we have no intelligence agencies. We have no way of knowing when there's going to be another enemy attack, where the enemy is located, if we want to attack. It's very hard to sort of believe this in the day and time when we have 17 intelligence agencies in Washington, D.C. We had none of those when we were entering World War II. When we needed intelligence more than we ever had, we didn't have a CIA. We didn't have an NSA. We didn't have a director of national intelligence. You know, we have intelligence agencies now whose job is to oversee other intelligence agencies. We didn't have anything like that back then. And of course, we would form the OSS very quickly and begin to build a spy network overseas. But the one thing we could do right away is ramp up our, our ability to intercept the radio signal the encrypted and encoded radio signals that military commanders, that, uh, that politicians, that diplomats were sending through the airwaves, uh, you know, thousands of messages on a daily basis announcing their whereabouts, announcing their plans, discussing their strategy. All of this was traveling through the airwaves, typically by radio, sometimes by telegraph, uh, sent by Morse code, and encrypted the same way that our incessant internet messages that we send every day, our texts, our emails, our Instagrams, our tweets, are often encrypted. Uh, that was what was happening as all of these militaries were strung out all over the world. So Admiral Donitz, who is commanding his U boat fleet, commanding each U boat individually, is sending messages to those boats every day. We want to learn how to snatch those signals and break them. We had had very small code-breaking operations, the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy, before the war, so we need to scale up, basically. We need to scale those operations in a massive way at exactly the time that the educated young men that the military normally would have turned to to do this work were suddenly unavailable because they were fighting. And so the U.S. military makes a decision. If the educated young men are unavailable to us, let's give the women a chance. Let's open up some fields of endeavor to smart, motivated women. And so when I was doing my work also at the National Archives in College Park, which is a wonderful research facility, uh, and it's the opposite of thin beer, I can assure you, there are thousands and thousands of records at the National Archives, I found this one, in which some bureaucrat at the U.S. Navy got the bright idea 
the Navy had, had a small correspondence course going on for years in which they would recruit um, sort of dabblers in, in cryptology. They would, uh, they would try to bring in hobbyists, people who might join their civilian code-breaking force in the 1930s. So they had a correspondence course already, and they would periodically produce memos saying where they were looking for these kinds of people, these, these um, you know, per particular kinds of brains they wanted. And so you can see this memo says, New Source Women's Colleges. So it's as though the light bulb went on in somebody's head, let's see what the women can do and if they can do this work. And the result of this memo and the decision and the fear in the US Navy that another attack would happen like Pearl Harbor, this was a great intelligence failure. The Navy knew that. Careers were ended. People felt enormous guilt. They couldn't let this happen. So in a moment of desperation and crisis, let's be inclusive. Let's bring in the women. So as a result of this, women not only at Gaucho, but at the Seven Sisters Colleges in the Northeast, on the Northeastern Seaboard, the sort of elite women's colleges that were seen by the Navy as the counterpart to the male Ivy League, Senior women who were identified by their, uh, by their deans and their professors, often math professors and astronomy professors, would identify young women who were talented at math, at science, at languages, but who also showed grit, who showed persistence, who showed the willingness to overcome frustration. They would secretly tap these women who would be called in to their great surprise and would be asked two questions. Do you like crossword puzzles and are you engaged to be married? And if they answered no, yes to the first and no to the second, they would be invited to take this secret naval cryptanalytic training course, again, in great secrecy during the course of their senior year. Many of the women were, in fact, engaged because there was enormous pressure on women to get married as World War II started. Men were shipping out. They wanted to have somebody waiting for them at home. They wanted to have somebody to write to. So a lot of the women lied, actually. And, and although they were engaged, whatever they were being invited to do sounded a lot more interesting than sitting around waiting to see if their brother brothers would be okay or their boyfriends would be okay. They wanted to join the war effort. So they lied. They said they weren't engaged. They took the course. And they came to Washington, D.C. Uh, to work as civilians in June of 1942 at exactly the time when the Battle of Midway, which was one of the great sea battles of all time, it was our first payback for Pearl Harbor, uh, showed the U.S. military secretly, because the public didn't know or shouldn't know, how important code breaking was going to be to the war effort. This was a time when we did not know that we were going to win World War II. It was not a foreordained conclusion. There was enormous concern uh, that, that we might not prevail. You know, the Atlantic coast was, uh, was besieged by U-boats. Uh, there was enormous fear in the American public, but the Battle of Midway was the beginning of a turning point in the Pacific, and it turned on brilliant code breaking that warned us that the Japanese were en route to ambush us and basically finish us off, and instead we were able to ambush the Japanese fleet and win that battle. And so that signaled to the people who needed to know that code breaking was going to be important. And the women started pouring in from the Seven Sisters Colleges at exactly the moment when we knew how important this was going to be. But meanwhile, the U.S. Army also needs to compete for educated women because the, the setup at our entry into the war is that the, the U.K. has lead code-breaking responsibility, responsibility for the Atlantic Ocean and the European theater. So if you've seen the imitation game, you've heard of the other great code-breaking success, which is our breaking of the Enigma cipher, the, England's breaking of the Enigma cipher. Uh, and, and the ability to read the German messages that were, they were controlling the U-boats as well as uh, the movements of the, of the Air Force and the Army. So when we enter the war, we have a vested stake in the Atlantic as well because we're sending our boys on convoys through the Atlantic, which is riddled with U-boats. So we care, but we're going to... We're going to be the junior partner in that code-breaking effort. But meanwhile, we have lead and really sole code-breaking responsibility in the vast, vast Pacific Ocean. So the U.S. Navy, which has just recruited the women from the Seven Sisters School and Goucher and other schools, is going to be working primarily the Japanese Naval Fleet Code, which is the, the major code system that is being used by the Japanese Navy. But the Japanese Army has a completely different system, and they're now spread out all over, over, all over the Pacific. They've taken the Philippines. They've taken islands around the Pacific, land masses. And again, they're communicating through signals. And our U.S. Army has responsibility for, the, for those signal systems and they need to recruit women as well. So they figure, they make a different calculation. They figure, okay, our competitors in the U.S. Navy have the Eastern Seaboard. 
Uh, and so we're going to compete for school teachers. We're going to turn to teaching colleges, which were the other institutions that existed to educate women. So for example, Dorothy Ramali, who I interviewed for my book, was, uh, was at, at Indiana State Teachers College in Indiana, Pennsylvania. She had grown up in rural Pennsylvania. Uh, she wanted to be a math teacher. That was, uh, that was a, uh, an ambitious aspiration for a woman uh, because women were not encouraged to go into math. They were sometimes not hired as teachers, but that's what she wanted to do. That was her passion. And she was called in by the Dean of Women uh, and invited to take the Army's secret cryptanalytic training course. But even, even women in teachers' colleges weren't going to be enough for the enormous code-breaking operations that we were going to have to establish. So the Army decided it would also go after school teachers, young women who were actually teaching school. They were going to be young, they were going to be hardworking, they were going to be single, they were going to be well-educated, and they were going to be underpaid. And so they were going to be extremely motivated to, to take better paying work with the War Department. So the Army strategy was to, um, and, and I literally found oral histories in which commanders congratulated themselves for their strategy. They were thinking that, uh, they, they decided to send their handsomest young Army officers out to lurk in hotels and post offices, at recruiting stations, particularly around the American South. They were recruiting women as civilians, and the bureaucratic rules confined them at first to Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and West Virginia. The thinking was that Southern women were particularly susceptible to the charms of a handsome man, and that all of these hardworking, smart young school teachers would be motivated to come to Washington to do secret war work, thinking that they would marry a man who looked like the recruiting officer. And what I love about the, that thinking about women's motivation is that my central character, Dot Braden, who is still alive and going strong, uh, represents you know, just sort of how wrong-headed that strategy was. Like many young American women, she was engaged, uh, but unwillingly so. Her college boyfriend had sent her a ring from training camp in California. Women were told not to upset morale of the troops. She didn't want to get married. She didn't want to get married right out of college. She didn't particularly want to marry this guy. She liked him, but she didn't envision spending the rest of her life with him. Like She wanted an excuse not to have to get married and, and go to his training camp in California. And so the prospect of, of war work in Washington gave her an out from what would have been her foreordained sort of uh, life trajectory. It gave her an excuse not to go to California. She was also motivated because she was the oldest daughter in a family of four. She had two younger brothers who were already in the US Army, uh, one of them right out of high school, literally the day he graduated from high school. Uh, so like all American families, she had a very personal interest in the outcome of the war. The Braden family was typical in that they were volunteering everything they could to the war effort. People were donating pots and pans, they were picking up rubber bands from the street. The Braden family tried to donate their family dog, Poochie, to train to become a war dog. She still has the single space letter that they got back from the Army War Dog Training Center saying, thank you for your, uh, for your, your contribution or for your offer. Unfortunately, we have an age cap on our, on our war dogs and Poochie was too old. So Poochie had to stay home, uh, but, but that's how motivated people were to join the war effort. And so Dot was also in her first year of teaching at Chatham High School. All the male teachers had left. Many of the female teachers had left to, to marry the men. So she was teaching English, French, Latin, physics, something called hygiene. She was incredibly burdened by her teaching load. She was making $900 a month teaching school in Chatham. She came home to her mom in Lynchburg and she said, I just can't do that anymore. Her mom said, well, there are these recruiters uh, at the Virginia Hotel in, uh, in Lynchburg. Go see what they want. So when Dot walked through the hotel uh, door, she didn't care whether that recruiter was good looking. Uh, she knew that this was war work, that it was important, that it was in Washington, DC. Lynchburg was three hours away from Washington, DC. She had never been there. She grew up during the Depression. People didn't travel. She had never seen the big city. This was an opportunity to join the war effort to try to help her brothers. Uh, and, and to make $1,660 uh, working for the War Department, which was almost twice what she would make as a teacher. Uh, so like thousands of other Southern school teachers, Dot got on the train one morning and came to Washington, D.C. and found herself in Union Station with a little bit of monkey, money in her pocketbook and no idea what she had signed up to do. Because this recruiting of school teachers was taking place in public, they couldn't even tell the women what they had signed up for. She took a cab into Arlington, in Virginia, and she found herself at what had up until recently been a junior college. And junior
junior colleges were a thing back then. Uh, they were a way to give women some education without giving them too much education. So they basically amounted to two years of high school and two years of college. The women could get some English, some math, maybe some French, some piano, some typing, some horseback riding, uh, you know, the kinds of things that would prepare them for adulthood. So the Army needed a big, secure, off the beaten path compound for its code breaking effort. So it kicked the girls out, it requisitioned Arlington Hall, it, it built um, enormous uh, temporary buildings where the riding paths had been, uh, and it, 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 it routed these southern school teachers into these massive, hot, temporary buildings. Uh, the, the first day in Washington, Dot had no idea what she was signing up to do, but she had to sign a loyalty oath to the US government. She had to sign a secrecy oath, agreeing that she would never talk about it. It was wartime. The penalty for revealing top secret work was death. And so she knew that whatever she was going to be doing, she would be shot. If, uh, if she told anybody about it. So that was her welcome to Washington. Uh, all of the women who came to do this work would be told that if anybody asked them what they were doing in these compounds, they were to say that they were secretaries, that they sharpened pencils, they emptied waste baskets, they did unimportant work. Some said that they sat on the laps of their commanding officers. Uh, everybody believed that because they were women, the work they, they were doing had to be trivial. And so in that, in that way, they were the ideal intelligence officers of the time because people just assumed that whatever they were doing inside these top secret compounds, it couldn't be really important to the war effort. Uh, but instead, Dot joined classrooms where school teachers were very hastily instructed, uh, in this case, in the geography of Asia. Uh, these are women who would be receiving the messages that we intercepted from the Pacific. We would encrypt them with our own encryption, send them to Arlington Hall. Uh, we, would, we would strip out the American encryption, and then school teachers like Dot would get started on the messages. This is the room that Dot would have worked in. You can see all of these young women working at tables. She still has a hard time believing that she had joined what would be the third of the three most important code-breaking triumphs of World War II. So one of them was the Battle of Midway, one of them was breaking of the Enigma Cipher, but the third, which doesn't get as much attention because it's not like a single dramatic moment, was our relentless shipping, sinking of the ships that were supplying the Japanese army all around the Pacific. Uh, the Japanese were on islands for the most part. They had to be regularly supplied with water, with food, with fuel, with medicine, with spare airplane parts, with reinforcement troops. All of that was brought by ship. Those ships were sending messages every day saying where they were coming from, where they were going to. It was a complicated system called an enciphered code system. Uh, a word like Maru for supply ship would be rendered as a four-digit code group. Uh, another four digits would be added to that to change the numbers. That's, that was an early form of encryption. And that would be sent by Morse code through the airwaves. We would snatch that out of the air. The school teachers would start stripping out that encryption, stripping out the extraneous numbers to get down to the code group and then trying to figure out what they meant. Because they did their work so well, because they did it so rapidly, Dot remembers running to get the messages to the next stage. Uh, we were able to sink thousands of supplies ships, the information in the messages would be sent to American submarine commanders who would be waiting when the supply ships appeared. They were relentlessly sunk, and the result of that was that most Japanese army deaths were the result of starvation and disease. That's how well the school teachers did their job. Uh, Dot remembers that she would get the message along as far as she could, and she would take it to uh, a woman called the overlapper. Uh, and she was very nervous about speaking that word because the women were told never to even utter certain words on the streets of Washington. Overlap was a term of art, and if they spoke it on, on the street, maybe somebody from the Axis would overhear. So when I did my interview with her, or my, my many interviews with her, she had never even used the word overlapper, and she felt uneasy about saying it even now. But what she remembered, and this is, this is one of my favorite parts of the story, is that the overlapper was a woman named Miriam, and she was from New York City, uh, because there were women who were recruited from northern colleges as well. And Dot remembers Miriam as being the most condescending northerner she had ever met. Uh, and I'm from the same part of Virginia that Dot is, so I somewhat identified with this part of the story, I have to admit. Uh, and, uh, and she recalled that Miriam would make fun of her accent, would make fun of her southern accent. Uh, and it's true that at Arlington Hall, you know, even as American GIs were going all over the world, at great peril and risk to their lives. They were seeing the South Pacific. They were seeing Paris. These women were coming together. They were seeing Washington. 
Washington, and they were meeting women from other parts of the country. So, but, uh, but they were also having to function with them in a workplace, and it was incredibly important work, but it was also a government workplace. And Miriam got on Dot's nerves uh, because the women clashed. They were from different parts of the country. The Northerners tended to see the Southern women as being less well-educated. Uh, there were also men working at the code-breaking facility who were too old for the fighting, so there were many distinguished men from publishing circles in New York City who came down to work in the code-breaking operation as well, and one of them referred to the Southern women as the jewels. And the reason he called them that was because he felt so many Southern women were named Opal or Pearl or Ruby or Emerald. Uh, and I have to admit, when I went through the rosters at the National Archives, there were a lot of women named Ruby and Emerald and Pearl, and there were also some jewels. And one of the women that I interviewed uh, for this book, Jewel Esmacher in South Carolina, she was a graduate of Winthrop College in South Carolina. She was a high school band director when she was recruited to do this work. And musical talent is also a marker for code-breaking ability because it involves the, the ability to follow patterns. Uh, so I have, to, I have to grant that there were a fair amount of Southern women who, um, who had jewel-like names. I love this photo because the women that you see laughing down at her work, sitting next to the dead plant, she had been recruited as an English major out of Russell Sage College outside of New York, uh, and uh, and she she working with a West Virginia school teacher named Wilma Berryman. Those two women broke a separate code system that was that appended every uh, Japanese Army message. It was the address. It was the address of where it was coming to and where it was destined for the person sending it, the rank of the person sending it, the person receiving it, the rank of that person. A, a vast amount of useful information for our military to have because we want to know where the Japanese are, where they're going to, who they're communicating with, if a flurry of messages is going to a new location, maybe something is being planned. So thanks to their breaking of that particular message system, we were able to provide the Pentagon every day with something called order of battle that showed where the Japanese army was located uh, and where messages, new messages were being sent to. So that was incredibly important intelligence. These women were generating intelligence that the Pentagon was actually breathing down their neck to get that order of battle import, uh, report every day. Uh, just to give you a sense of how many code and cipher systems were in play during the war, the Japanese diplomats who were stationed in Europe, in all the occupied countries, all the Axis countries, they were communicating back with Tokyo using a completely different cipher system. It was a machine that scrambled Romanized Japanese uh, into, you know, unintelligible gibberish. We had broken that machine system uh, before the war, thanks to a woman named Genevieve Grochen. We were reading all of those diplomatic communications. One of the most important bits of intelligence we got from the Japanese diplomats about Europe was when they were invited to tour the coast of France before D-Day. They were dutifully reported back to Tokyo on where the coast of France was well fortified and where it wasn't. So we knew that when we were planning the Allied land, that, uh, that Normandy would be a better place to land than other parts of the French coast. So that's the kind of information that we were getting from these code-breaking operations. Again, this just gives you a sense of the number of women who were doing this work. There was also an African-American code-breaking unit at Arlington Hall. The U.S. Army was segregated during World War II, so the code-breaking operation was segregated as well. This was a secret unit. A lot of the white workers didn't even know about it, but this group of very well-educated, very dedicated, probably former school teachers who had attained their education in a, in a segregated U.S. education system were lending their talents to breaking the codes and ciphers of the private sector. So just as banks and companies today encrypt all of their financial communication when they send it over the internet, so too were they doing that back then. This unit was reading the codes and ciphers of banks and companies to see who was doing business with Hitler, who was doing business with Japanese companies like Mitsubishi, because of course they weren't supposed to be doing that. So this was very important work, and this was a very unsung unit. Uh, they were also doing early cybersecurity, looking for um, to make sure that our encrypted traffic that we were sending was more secure than, than the code systems that we were reading. They were also planning deception programs creating something called dummy traffic that would persuade the enemy, just because of the signals we were sending, would persuade the enemy that we had troop stations where none existed. And again, before the D-Day landings, uh, this dummy traffic persuaded the Germans that we had allied troops ready to invade Calais. So they thought the made landing was going to come in Calais. 
So meanwhile, during World War II, this is the tipping point. This is the first uh, really major experiment with it, admitting women into the military. And the decision was made in, uh, in 1942 to admit women into the Army uh, and also to admit women into the Navy. It was a hard-fought battle. Many of the deans and professors at the women colleges uh, really pressed the Navy to admit young women. They saw this as an opportunity, again, to expand opportunities for their graduates. So the women who came to Washington, you saw them in those frilly dresses at the beginning, uh, they, they were ultimately, the Navy wanted its female code breakers to be, to be subject to military discipline and the military hierarchy. So they were trained as, to become naval officers. So you can see them here, uh, actually they're crossing Nebraska Avenue. The Navy also needed a lot more space than it had had downtown, so it commandeered Mount Vernon Seminary, which was on Nebraska Avenue, where Department of Homeland Security is now, kicked those girls out. The girls had to take classes at Garfinkel's department store um, while they were finding a place to study. And they set up a massive code-breaking operation. The women were housed in barracks near American University. You can see them crossing the street. So this was a great moment for women to join the military. It was also a moment when women who had not had the benefit of a college education could enlist, you know, could enlist as ordinary seamen. And when they took their aptitude tests, if they tested high for ability, you know, and, and for the sort of the right kind of intellectual skills like math and languages, they would be secretly routed into the code-breaking operations. So again, this was a great coming together of women from all over the country, women from Colorado, uh, the Navy was looking for librarians, people who knew how to keep great records. Uh, so women came from Colorado, from California, from Oklahoma. They got on troop trains, they traveled for days, they went to boot camp and officer training camp, and they came together, thousands of women working at these compounds. One of my favorite anecdotes about the coming together of these women, uh, one of the women I interviewed for, um, for this book, Jane Case, actually came from a very affluent family in New York City. She grew up, um, uh, in Auburn, New York, and then on the Upper East Side of New York City, uh, a very um, a very sort of debutante kind of society that she was kind of expecting to have to be part of. Uh, when, the, when the war started, she again wanted to do anything she could. She, she desperately wanted to enlist in the U.S. Navy. Her parents didn't want her to. There was a lot of stigma at first associated with these women. They were considered to be bad women. There were whisper campaigns against them. Uh, the, the thinking was that they were being put into the military to service the men sexually. Uh, and so some parents didn't want their daughters joining up, but Jane was determined. Uh, so she took the subway down to Wall Street, uh, where there was a naval recruiting station. She expected that she would go in with an officer, as an officer, because she came from such an upper class family, and she knew she'd have to pass an eye exam, So she had, and she was very, very nearsighted, and she had memorized the eye chart in order to make it through the eye exam. She slipped her spectacles in her pocket, uh, and she did make it through the eye exam, but she didn't know that there were going to be a lot of other medical stations, including a gynecological exam, which was a shock for a lot of the women, but there was also a, a physical exam, and, and men at the time were forced to undergo a group naked physical to join the Navy, the Navy was trying to figure out whether uh, you know, it should sort of do the same things for women that it was doing for men. Uh, so the women had a, a naked group physical as well. And Jane still remembers the shock of being told to disrobe, and then she remembers that a petty officer drew the number nine between her breasts and said, okay, go stand between eight and ten. And she had never seen another woman without her clothes on. And because she was so nearsighted, she not only had to look, she had to really peer in order to uh, <laughs> in order to figure out where she was supposed to stand. So she remembers that fondly uh, as sort of, you know, you're, you're in the Navy now. And, and this, was, um, this, was, this was something quite different than the debutante society she had been raised to. And when she lived, and, and she also found that she'd gone to music, call, music school after graduating from high school. The Navy didn't consider that to be equivalent of two years of college. So she went in as an ordinary seaman. She went in as an enlisted woman. And because of her ability with math, uh, her dad was a physicist. And because of, of her chops, she was rounded into the code-breaking operation as well, and she loved it. Her first roommate was uh, from the, the Midwest, and, uh, and her dad was an undertaker and gave his daughter a music box in the shape of a casket. And so that was Jane's introduction to sort of other American decorating schemes that, that she had not grown up with. So the, uh, the Navy women... Uh, worked at this huge compound. I found these, uh, these photographs in the National Archives just kind of swimming around in files. As you can see, I had to get them declassified. But they're wonderful photos of the interior of the Navy code-breaking unit. The women were working the Japanese Naval Fleet Code. You can see on the table massive stacks of Japanese messages. Jane remembered we could tell what was happening in the Pacific because the stack would get larger. They had to make decisions about which messages were important. They had to push them along as fast as they could. They too 
you had to strip out numerical encipherment called additives in order to get down to the code groups. Uh, they were under incredible pressure. They knew that their brothers were in the Pacific. They were sometimes breaking messages that told the, the location and the, and the whereabouts and the, the fate of their brothers and their boyfriend ships. They knew the stakes. Uh, I found memos in the National Archives in which uh, their officers would say, you all recovered 2,000 2, additives last month. We need more this month. You know, we're planning to push back uh, across the Pacific. We want to retake the Philippines. Uh, this work is incredibly important. We need to know where the enemy is. Uh, and so we need you all to work harder and faster. And I would see memos congratulating them for not only meeting their quota, but for exceeding it. Uh, so this will show you, this is one of the worksheets. The Japanese Naval Fleet Code was a five-digit enciphered code system. I just love these worksheets. Again, they're swimming in files of the National Archives. Uh, but they give you a sense of the brain work that the women had to do in order to recover these additives. Uh, I also love this table. It, again, it shows you how many different code systems there were. Uh, this was a completely different system. It was a lesser system that the Japanese Navy, sort of an ad hoc system they set up. Uh, completely different. It was letters, not numbers. There was a group of women from Wellesley who were assigned to work the Inner Island Cipher. It had a key that changed every month, and they had to break back into the um, into the system, they had to determine the new key that was being used uh, to sort of control the system every month. And they got so good at that. And I found records talking about how good they were at that, uh, that they could sort of work really hard for four or five days and then go a little bit on autopilot for the rest of the month. And you have to remember that these women were living unchaperoned for the first time in their lives in Washington, D.C. There was a lot of alcohol in Washington during World War II. And if the women were naval officers, they could live in group houses. They didn't have to live in barracks. So they could have parties. And the Wellesley women had big blowouts. And I found an oral history of their commanding officer who very much admired their intelligence but also admired their partying spirits. He would remember that one of the mathematicians in particular, uh, a math major from Wellesley, would come to him and ask when she could have her next big party. And he would look at the wall map and he would say, okay, the key is going to change at X day of the month. You can have your party two weeks before that because then you can recover from your hangovers for two weeks before you have to really imply your intellect. But again, to give you a sense of the stakes, uh, in April of 1942, we received messages in the Pacific saying that Admiral Yamamoto, who commanded the Japanese naval fleet and was the mastermind of Pearl Harbor, was going to be making an inspection tour of the Solomon Islands. Uh, the inner island cipher was part of this set of communications. Men in the Pacific, American men in the Pacific, got busy on the naval fleet code messages. These women got busy on the inner island cipher, they put together his exact itinerary down to the minute so that we were able to send planes up and shoot his plane out of the air and basically make the decision to assassinate an enemy commander. Uh, and the women remembered that uh, that cheering went up in the naval code breaking compound when they knew that the admiral's plane had been shot down. Of course, the American public and the Japanese could not know that it happened as a result of code breaking, but the women knew. And, and, and it's important, I think, to point out that they felt great satisfaction at the time when they knew that their work had actually contributed to the sinking of a convoy or a fleet uh, or, or to the downing of an important airplane. Uh, it was, you know, it was war. We wanted to win it. They knew that lives were at stake, again, of their brothers and boyfriends. They knew that America was at stake and freedom was at stake. So they, you know, they wanted to win and they wanted to do what had to be done. Later on in their lives, they would come to have more complex feelings about the, um, you know, lethal work that they were part of. But at the time, there were no second thoughts. Uh, so just to quickly point out, we eventually, really became the senior partner in the breaking of the Enigma cipher that Admiral Donitz was using to command his U-boats. Uh, the Germans suspected that we were reading their code system. They changed the Enigma machine that was being used by the U-boats. They added an extra rotor that scrambled the messages even more than they had been scrambled before. And so the American industrial um, resources had to get involved to build these giant machines that could handle a four-rotor Enigma machine. The old one had been three rotors, and now we needed sort of more heavy-duty, faster machines. And so uh, the Americans designed and built these machines that were secretly transported, again, to the naval code-breaking compound. For me, one of the most moving, uh, and ultimately it was really women who were working the German Enigma cipher system. It involved a lot of math. It involved designing early computer menus in order to break into those messages. And one of the most moving chapters to me of the book was when the women uh, joined the midnight watch on the, on the night of June 6th. Uh, early morning June 5th and then going into June 6th. They knew that the D-Day landings were going to happen. They didn't know when they were going to happen. It was a full moon. They assumed that that was not 
ideal for a secret Allied landing, so they thought it wasn't going to happen on the 6th. But they remembered that at about 1.30 in the morning, our time, they started getting messages. You know, the machines started spinning. Uh, the Germans started chattering. And, and it was they, they were experiencing, these women were experiencing the D-Day landings from the point of view of the Germans. And the first messages were basically German, uh, you know, uh, officers saying, seeing thousands and thousands of allied ships on the horizon saying, oh my God, the landing is happening and it's happening in Normandy. And so the women remembered all that night just working as fast as they could to break the German messages. So they were in the unique position of experiencing the D-Day landing from the point of view of the Germans who were communicating about what was going on. Uh, so they knew the landings were happening. They knew that they had brothers and boyfriends and fiancés that were making the landing. Uh, they didn't know how it was going. You know, they couldn't tell from the German messages everything about the D-Day invasion. So they were really overwhelmed by the enormity of what they were part of. And at the end of their, of their midnight shift, they remember taking the bus to National Cathedral and then going into St. Albans Chapel, which was open 24-7 during World War II, and praying because they, they didn't know, you know what the outcome was. They didn't know how many lives had been lost. And a number of them had, in fact, lost their fiancés in the invasion. And they just didn't know that yet because they hadn't gotten the telegram. Uh, these are some photos of my central character. You can see Dot Braden behind the pole. At the same time, again, that they were doing this incredibly serious, urgent, stressful work, they were having a good time in Washington. They were riding lots of men. My central character was actually riding um, half a dozen men. Uh, she was so, in some ways more reluctant to confess that to me than she was to talk about her secret crowd breaking work. Uh, she disentangled herself from her engagement and, and ultimately married one of the men that she was writing to, had a very happy marriage. Uh, she became best friends with a school teacher from Bourbon, Mississippi, Ruth Weston, an incredible mathematician who would go on to work for the NSA as a mathematician. The women remained best friends for the rest of their lives. You can see them there with their husbands. Uh, they remained such close friends. After the war, they could never talk to each other about their code-breaking work. They didn't even know that they were part of the same code-breaking effort to break the supply ships. They knew they both worked in the same compound, but they were terrified of talking about their work either before or after the war. All these women were told at the end of the war, thanks very much for your efforts. Uh, you saved thousands of lives. You shortened the war by at least a year. Now, never tell anybody what you did. And so they went into later life never talking about this work. Uh, Dot's brothers both survived the war. They um, both of her brothers would uh, take jobs that involved top secret security clearances. They would get together and brag about their secret security clearances. Dot could never tell them that she also had a top secret security clearance. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that the women had to put up with for decades and decades for the rest of their lives. But they remained so close that their children for a long time thought they were cousins. Their children thought they were related to each other because they knew that, their, that these two women shared a great friendship as well as a secret, some secret about what they had done during the war. Uh, this is a group of naval enlisted women who also remained great friends after the war was over. Uh, only one of them is still alive, Ruth Mursky, who you can see in the striped shirt. Uh, and her email when she communicates with me is Ruth the Wave. So uh, at, you know, at 95, she's on email because they were code girls then and they're code girls now. And this work, although they couldn't talk about it for 75 years, uh, remained so important to them that that would, you know, that she chose that as her email address. Uh, and I just wanted to, to end with a couple of quick videos that give you a sense of the women, of talking about their work, talking about what was important to them, uh, and remembering, you know, some of their most memorable experiences. So this is Dot. With my two suitcases, my umbrella, and my raincoat, I went down to the train. Now my uncle had to take me down there. No car. And my mother and her sister were standing there crying when I got on the train. I was very secure that everything was going to be just fine. Washington would receive me with open arms. And of course, the message she got in Washington was that she would be shot if she told anybody what she was doing. So, uh, so the next woman, Anne Seeley, was recruited out of Smith College in 1942, and she would work the Japanese Naval Fleet Code. A narrative is obviously something that you add, uh, but what do you add it to? You add it to a five-digit code group, and the code group has a meaning, which is either a word, or a phrase, or a sentence, or a Roman letter, 
because we're dealing in Japanese mm -hmm. now, though they didn't make much use of the Roman letters, but they often did to spell names of right. people like mm -hmm. Roosevelt. So her memory was so sharp, she had never talked about this in 75 years, and she remembered that the Japanese would have to have a different code group for every letter of the name Roosevelt, because they might not have, you know, an actual a character that stood for, uh, for Roosevelt. So her memory was so sharp, she actually showed me the math that she had to do in order to recover the additives. She got a little irritated when I seemed a little slow on the uptake. Uh, so, um, so uh, because I was saying, well, it, they had added it, so did you s subtract or add? And she said, well, we would zeroize and add. I mean, you know, how hard is that. So I just loved how precise her memory was of this work that she, she had never told anybody about. Uh, the next woman, Betty Bemis Robards, worked those, uh, helped build those, those machines that broke the German Enigma cipher, uh, and then um, remembers basically the thanks that they got for the great work that they did. We broke the code in August of 1943, and everybody says, what did they tell you? I said, nothing. All that, that Commander Meter announced at, at supper one night, good job, job girls, hmm. you did good. And that's all he said. And the last woman, Dorothy Ramali, you saw her photo earlier in the presentation. She was recruited out of Indiana State Teachers College. And she remembers why it was so important to the women to, to do this work when they were recruited. bus came, and it was at 2 o'clock in the morning that the Army sent a bus to get these, oh, I don't know, it seemed to me it was all the men, you know, that, that there were no men left in the college at that time because they all had to go, I think, to Pittsburgh. You see, since I was taking mathematics. A lot of times uh, I was one of maybe two girls that were in the classes, you see. So I knew so many of the fellows that were go going on that bus. Uh, I'll never forget. So Dorothy Romali was such a uh was such a, a, a successful code breaker that the U.S. Navy actually stole her from the U.S. Army. She was that good. Uh, and, and what I love about her is that she, uh, she became a math teacher after the war. She never told anybody what she did. She would end up teaching at the public middle school in Arlington, Virginia, that my own children would ultimately attend, Swanson, uh, and then Yorktown High School. And, and I just love the thought of these middle school kids taking Miss Romali's Algebra I class and having no idea that this sweet woman, who people remember as an incredible math teacher, had been... Um, such a badass code breaker during World War II. Uh, and, uh, and of course, she never talked about it, you know, until, until I interviewed her. And, and, and she's also an example of the fact that these women walked among us, you know, for decades and decades, and in many cases still walk among us. They never expected credit for what they did. In most cases, they never got any credit for what they did. They took the secret to their graves. Uh, I felt very fortunate, ultimately, to be able to find 20 women, living women, who could talk about their work. You see how excellent their memories were, uh, and to be able to, you know, to try and get them some credit for, uh, for the, the incredible contribution that they made to winning the war uh, and, and to American freedom and democracy, I mean, that's not an overstatement. Uh, and, and, and again, never expecting credit. Uh, one of the, I, I will say that by the time I was interviewing them, they, they knew that they had been left out of history. They knew that, his, that books that were written about Pacific code breaking and Atlantic code breaking during the 90s, you know, had pretty much not told their story because the women had been so good about not speaking up. Uh, and one of the women I interviewed in an emergency room in Atlanta because she had broken her wrist the night before, I learned that emergency rooms are good places to interview because you have to wait a long time and they can't, person can't go anywhere. Uh, but she said that, you know, I just hope that I live long enough to see the book published. And, and I, I'm happy to say that she did. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for listening. It's been a great honor to work with the Library of Congress and try to tell the story. And I think we have time for a few questions. I was going to do a closing
Thank you, Liza, for bringing to light the stories of these incredible women and the contributions they made to the course of war, technology, code breaking, and cybersecurity. Because of your work using primary sources like those found at the Veterans History Project, stories like these cannot be ignored. They will forever be included in the annals of history. When we first started planning this book talk, we were thinking about how great it would be to have some of those code girls here with us today. But because they're uh, generally in their 90s and a bit frail, um, we thought, well, let's do the next best thing. And Liza helped us reach out to those families and get some of those collections that we didn't have in our archives here. And in February, we received a package containing an oral history interview, photographs, and a, a, a memoir that was written by Elizabeth McClure Bennett. And her son, George Bennett Jr., when he found out what we were doing, rallied his family to collect these items and send them to us right away. In one of the emails he sent to our staff, he wrote, my mother is still alive, but her health has been very poor all over the last several years. Our family is very grateful to Liza Monday for her great book featuring the Code Girls and to you and the Veterans History Project for, for preserving the story of these remarkable women. I'm very sad to report that Mrs. Bennett passed away on the 16th of March at the ripe old age of 96. I would suggest to you she lived a good life. I understand that her family is watching live on YouTube and her son Doug uh, flew in from Indianapolis to be with us today. So thank you, Doug. And I want, I want them to understand how grateful that we are uh, to make sure that their mom's story is going to live on in perpetuity here at the library. And so, uh, again, thank you for that round of applause for Doug and his family. And in closing, if you are like the Bennetts and have a veteran in your life, living or deceased, no matter the gender, branch, service, or military assignment, please consider donating their story to the Veterans History Project. Uh, we've got a table set up outside where you can get our field kit. You can go up our website, loc.gov forward slash vets, and hear some amazing stories. And this way you can preserve, you can ensure that a loved one's story will be preserved and not lost or forgotten. So again, thank you for joining us today. And now we have some time for questions for, uh, with, with you and with Liza. So without further ado. Did any of the women demand proof that it was now unclassified and that they could talk about it, or did they just believe you? Uh, it did, in some cases, take persuasion. It took me about a half an hour to persuade Dot that she wouldn't be put in prison uh, if she if she spoke, and, and I told her that if she was, it would probably be a nice prison at her age. And, um, uh, so, uh, it did, in some cases, it did take some coaxing. And, and I will say that they had been released from their oath of secrecy uh, back in the 1990s, but nobody had tracked them down and told them. So they were free to speak. Uh, yes, uh, your pictures of the crossing on Wisconsin Avenue a number of years ago, I had an opportunity to look at some photographs in the DDOT collection. And the first walk, don't walk uh, pedestrian uh, signals were installed in the District of Columbia at that site. So I guess they were concerned about the safety of these women. <laughs> yes, yes, and they were also, yeah, they were also some neighbors who complained about noise and singing as well as necking in but, the woods. So, yeah. But in 1965, I was sent by the Army to uh, uh, Fort Meade and NSA for eight-week training in the photography. And six of us were sent. We walked into the training unit that day, and we were totally surrounded by women. And I'm wondering if NSA is, is, is like that today, and if, if there are studies of women who are better wired for this type of uh, work. Well, I don't know, I don't know when that was, but uh, what I should have said that, that many of these women did stay on with the work after the war. We didn't roll up our code breaking after World War II because the Cold War started. So we would be breaking East German, Russian, Chinese, uh, communist code systems. And many of the women did stay with the work and went to work ultimately for the NSA. So you saw Ann Kara Christie laughing down at her dead plant. She would rise to become the first female deputy director of NSA. And many of the first super grades at, MS at NSA were women coming out of the war. Uh, so, so there was an important cohort of women who helped establish that agency.
I was curious, how does the Navy steal someone from the Army? And also, is that correspondence course in code breaking now public? Yes, so the correspondence courses can be found at the National Archives. I mean, they still exist as paper records. Uh, I'm sure there's an updated modern version of it, but you can find the ones from 1942. I, I did study them when I was trying to sort of understand how it worked. Uh, and um, uh, the, the way that the Navy stole her from the Army was it paid a little bit more money because she had a, uh, she had a college degree, so she knew she would go into the Navy as an officer, and she could get an officer's allowance. Uh, it, it wasn't that the salary was more, but she could get an officer's allowance for housing, and that bit more money, $50 a month or whatever it was, enabled her to buy a car. The other, her other goal in life was to see all the continents uh, in, the, in the world, which she did, but she was with her car. She was able after the war to drive to the West Coast, and that was really thrilling for her. So is money. Hi. Uh, I just have a quick question. Um, when an individual was given the code to break down, did they already, were they working like from a template? So they'd say, okay, if this is an X, it means B. If this is a 4, it means a Z. Or were they literally breaking down the code itself? They were breaking the message, so they would get the message and they would see the message. Uh, but there were, there were, you know, some of the again, some of the systems were were numerical and they had to do math. Some of them were. Uh, they would be looking at letters. There was a lot of variation, and they had to understand that particular system uh, and, and break it in, in real time. So the training courses that they had gotten at their colleges often really were, had nothing to do with the actual code systems that they, that they had to work on. They had to really learn it on the job because there was so much innovation and change taking place uh, during the war. Were there any women that you wanted to interview or that you wish you could have interviewed but had already passed on? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, and, and that's why I was so grateful for the oral histories in, in collections at the Library of Congress. And, and it was frustrating because sometimes the oral history interviewer wouldn't ask the question that I, I would have liked to have known. Uh, and um, uh, one of the women talked about the experience of losing her husband in the D-Day landing. He was a glider pilot. And... Uh, it was clearly something that, that she wanted to talk about. And she couldn't even go to his funeral because she was working those big machines and they had to continue after the day of landing because, of course, we were, we were going to be chasing the Germans through Europe at the Battle of the Bulge. It was very important. They wouldn't release the women from their stations, so she couldn't even go to her own husband's funeral. Uh, and I felt like that interviewer was a little bit uncomfortable talking to her about that loss because she said really that she loved him for the rest of her life. Uh, and, and so there were moments when I wished that, obviously, I could have talked to the women in, in person, but I was so grateful uh, for, for the oral history collections. Did you ever hear back from the editor who said that it was thin beer? No, but I, 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 hope, he's, I hope he's regretting those words. I actually found them very motivating. And so if any high school students are listening or college students and if a teacher says to you, you can't do that, or, you know, or if there's a young woman out there and who says, you know, you shouldn't go into STEM, uh, you know, don't listen to them and, and use it as a, a motivation because I, I, I got up every morning thinking again, okay, I'll show you thin beer. Uh, the, so the book has been optioned, uh, uh, and, and I, I'm told that, you know, there are a lot of stages that it has to go through, but there is, you know, thanks, Hidden Figures has, has really been wonderful for women's stories, for convincing publishers and also, I think, you know, uh, studios that, that there is an appetite for women's stories. We have people like Reese, Reese Witherspoon, you know, talking about the importance of women-fronted narratives, so, so I'm optimistic. I mean, it'd be, it'd be great to see. Hi, I was just kind of curious about your process. Like, did you find all of the info before, or did you have some kind of like narrative that it fit into? That is such a great question. So normally, I would have spent a lot of time reading books about code breaking. I would have spent a lot of time in the paper records to really educate myself, and then I would have gone to the women uh, when I had a really thorough grounding. But because of my actuarial actuarial deadline, because the women were in their mid-90s, mid I, I, I wanted to interview them first. Uh, and so I was, I, while I would be talking to them, I would be wondering if I would be able to find an actual uh, printed record that would substantiate their memories. 
uh, and I didn't know whether it would be out there. And again, I was amazed at how much there was in the National Archives and the Library of Congress that enabled me to substantiate. You saw Anne Seeley. She remembered something called a Shogoichi message, which was a noon position message. They would look for that. The Japanese uh, naval captains would, would send a message saying where they were going to be at noon the next day, which is the best possible piece of information for an American submarine commander to have. And when I finally got to the National Archives, I found references to Shogoichi messages all over the place. It was remarkable how accurate their memories were. So that's a great question. I had to, I had to do it backwards. Are, are there lists of people who worked in those groups uh, that uh, I know a number of people probably wonder and yeah. would like to look up, look up a name or so? That is such a great question. There aren't good, there's not a single good roster. I wish that NSA had the resources or, or the Cryptologic Museum had the resources. I, if they had more funding, I'm sure they would try to put together a roster. There are just scrambled files in which I might see some of the women who came down in 1942 and where they were living. And, uh, but there's no like one central place that where you could look at, at the names. Uh, but if there's somebody in your family or even somebody you know who might have done this work or who said she was a secretary, during the war. Uh, that information, those personnel records are public. And I have a website, www.lizamundy.com. I have a tab called for Co Resources for Codebreakers and Families. Uh, you can request anybody's wartime personnel record, and you can find out if and it says they were a cryptographer or a cryptologist. Uh, then that means they did this work. And you can often get their background reports, their college transcripts. It's kind of remarkable, actually, what's, what's available. And, and it's not hard. What was the seed or the idea that drew you to write this story? Uh, so all, many of our federal agencies have wonderful history offices and historians that, that generate and record the history of their agency. Uh, so the NSA knew that its origin story included these, these wartime women. And, and just as NASA knew that its origin story included the African-American women mathematicians of, of hidden figures. So uh, I read a declassified history of a small code-breaking project during the war that had been written by an NSA historian. Uh, it was out on the internet. Uh, classified at one point, but had been declassified. And it mentioned, this was the Russian code breaking, our, our small project during the war to break Russian messages. And, uh, and it mentioned that a lot of the people working that project were women, and a lot of them were former school teachers from the South. And that seemed really intriguing. So I made an appointment to speak with an NSA historian named Betsy Smoot, who was extremely helpful to me, uh, and a, and a curator at the Cryptologic Museum, which is attached to NSA at Fort Meade, uh, two women. And it was as though they had been waiting for somebody to come along who was interested in this story. And they sat with me for two hours and they explained, you know, the, the larger story that was that that was the mostly women breaking Japanese and German codes during the war. Uh, and then I just had to figure out whether I could find people and find uh, archival records. So, uh, so uh, a shout out to federal agency historians because they are wonderful. Um, so thank you so much. And I think we have some descendants of Code Girls in the audience as well. And I would just like to thank them so much uh, for their mother's service and their family's contributions uh, to our history. Thank you.